welcome to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach, and I'm joined today by Curtis Creighton. Curtis has a PhD in zoology from the University of Oklahoma, and he recently received a grant from the uh, Keystone McAllister Conservation Area and the American Bering Beetle Bank, LLC, for a research project uh, that involves the Keystone Pipeline, I understand. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what your project is. Well, it's indirectly involved with uh, with the pipeline. What I'm involved with is the American Bering Beetle, which is a federally listed endangered species. And this uh, beetle occurs in Oklahoma, where they're currently building a pipeline. And as part of the mitigation process, yeah. uh, the grant was awarded to do research on what's called a beetle bank. Uh, and the beetle bank was established as a mechanism to uh, allow people to develop pipelines or other things in areas where the beetle is known to occur. So they're going to tear things up over here, but they're going to preserve the species that might be affected over here, essentially. Right. right? So uh, we'll yeah. mess things up over here, but uh, we're going to give you money to preserve it or protect it somewhere right. else where it's known to occur. Right. Well, so you hear about, uh, you know, spotted owls and things standing in the way of progress. Uh, you know, how do you, what, what, do you defend this? Do you think that, you know, these beetles should be protected? And let's, because, you know, we never hear from the person who's, uh, uh, you know, who's the, 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 the faculty member who's out there doing the research and right. trying to protect the endangered species. So what's your, what's your side of the issue here? Well, I think that's a very complicated response, but I, as a first step, if, uh, you know, the Aldo Leopold, who was a rather famous conservation biologist and yeah. one of the founders of the, of the field, really, yeah. uh, he said that the first step of an intelligent tinkerer is to save all the parts. Uh, and so uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily know which parts are going to be critical or not critical, but uh, it is important to um, save the parts. And part of your research is to see how these uh, various species interact with one another and, and with other uh, processes that are going on in the, um, uh, in the environment and how that might eventually affect things, right? Absolutely. So what we do, and for what this project actually is, is looking at what uh, food items it uses to reproduce on. They have sort of a complicated uh, way in which they reproduce, and, and very little is actually known about uh, what they use as a reproductive resource for their for their young. Okay, uh, and and so you're that's a big issue right now because you're trying to to preserve them and keep them uh, uh, healthy in a different area essentially, right? Correct. Well, yeah. what you want to be able to do is understand their biology so that you can properly manage, uh, you know, the beetle bank, if you will, right. uh, so that uh, you don't manage it to the point where it's no longer suitable for for the beetle. Right. Um, National Geographic uh, said, uh, you want zombies, these beetles have most Hollywood horror films beat. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming this is a pretty interesting insect here. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, it? They are very interesting. They're very unusual among insects or any organism in that they provide, both parents provide care to their young. So they, uh, what they do so they is... They put them in, uh, you know, uh, vans and take them to soccer and things. Uh, exactly. Or, yeah. uh, at least uh, their version of it. Yeah. They, what they do is... Uh, reproduce on small dead animals, like a dead mouse okay. or, or a dead bird. And both parents will bury it underground, hence the name burying beetle. Okay. Uh, and then what they do is, if it's a, a mouse, for example, they remove all the fur from the mouse, uh, they uh, roll it up into a tight little ball, and then they have uh, specialized secretions, uh, oral and anal secretions, which actually mummifies the carcass under the ground. Okay. Uh, and these secretions have antimicrobial uh, molecules in them, uh, which pre preserve the carcass. That's uh, pretty complicated for a beetle. <laughs> um, you do research on this. How do uh, how does that that, so that can't be a learned behavior, right? I no, mean, how, how it's it's instinct. Develop? I mean, yeah. in, the, uh, in the sense that um, you know they don't they don't learn from their parents how to do that, but uh, uh, the parents do stick around and. After the young uh, arrive on the carcass, they feed on the carcass. Uh, what they then do is um, the parents will eat a little hole in the surface of the carcass so they can uh, feed from the inside. Both parents actually regurgitate 
uh, partially digested carrion back to the young. So the young actually will rear up and, and stroke the parents, just like a, the mouth parts of the parents, just like a, a bird would. Yeah. Uh, and then they regurgitate uh, the uh, carrion to the, to the babies. So they're actually dependent. They wouldn't survive without the presence of, of the yeah. parents. That's interesting, and they're actually cleaning up the, uh, the the grounds for us because they're burying these carcasses. I sure. think that's a, so. In terms of ecosystem phenomenon. processes, yeah, uh, they're important in terms of uh, re-establishing um, nutrients in the ground for then plants to absorb and, and uh, continue, you know, cycling yeah. nutrients. Yeah. Well, one of the terms uh, that you use is um, uh, the loss of biodiversity. Um, in, a, in generally, what you know, how does that impact us? What where have we lost biodiversity and what? Well, they, they um, you know, we have, many people consider us now going through what's called a mass extinction event. Uh, there's been uh, a number of previous max, uh, mass extinction events and this is the first one uh, caused by humans. Uh, the last one was when the dinosaurs went extinct. Right. Uh, the biggest one was um, the Permian extinction where 95% of all life went extinct. Uh, and it takes millions of years for the Earth to recover the same level of diversity. So, right. why is biodiversity important? Um, you know, there's a number of uh, there's intrinsic reasons. I mean, all organisms, uh, many people consider, have intrinsic value, and so they right. are allowed to exist on their own. Um, but then, I mean, if you think about it, then what extinction does is you have this long story, this long history of an organism which in the blink of an evolutionary eye right. uh, is snuffed out. And that story that was millions of years in the making is over. Because right. uh, once extinction occurs, they don't come back. Right. Well, so um, any examples of some things that we've lost already? I mean, I know, you know about the, you know, the pigeons and things like that, but I mean, any, anything at the insect level that uh, has impacted us? Well, it's difficult to say how they impact us. Yeah. Um, there's a, a number, I mean, of course, the passenger pigeon is the poster right. child of that. And right. it's kind of interesting to think about. 150 years ago, one in every third bird, so one third of all birds in North America was a passenger yeah. pigeon. That's They'd how abundant they were. They blacked the sky out when yeah. they flew over cities, uh, right. Yeah. And it was within a relatively few years that they disappeared. And they tried to put legislation in to say, let's, yeah. let's not kill so many. And people said, oh, no, we'll lose jobs. You know, people depend on this. <laughs> they, they, how, how will they make a living? Uh, and so that's the same argument you hear today, uh, that, oh, we'll lose jobs. And yeah. Well, so um, another term is behavioral ecology. What, what does that imply? So I'm a behavioral ecologist. Uh, so what I'm interested in is how uh, the natural world, specifically the, for me, specifically, the social environment influences uh, the evolution of behavior. Uh, and for example, in our burying beetles, when both parents provide parental care, uh, want, they are behaviorally been selected to make sure that the young they care for are their own. Uh, they are behaviorally selected to make sure the amount of babies they have on a carcass is equal to the amount of food available. So they'll actually uh, lay a bunch of extra eggs and then they'll eat uh, their own babies so that the result is that there's a positive relationship between the size of the carcass and the number of uh, young that they raise. Uh -huh. It's prudent family pr planning. That's, that's, that's <laughs> fascinating. How do you study that? How do you know that they're doing that? Well, you can, we can film it, uh, you can uh, observe it, you can I mean, go in every day and say, oh, there used to be 20 here, now there's 15. So you literally have a, uh, some kind of a camera you can, um, sure. you can put on the, uh, the carcass or the... What? We the have pot, them in right? the lab, yeah. uh, and we, uh, in a lot of the experiments we do, we do behavioral observations of the things that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and you know because of the repetition from watching these several times that they're doing these things obviously uh, deliberately and... Right, yeah. I mean, well, you know, if you give them a, you know, a 20 gram carcass, so like a mouse, yeah. Uh, yeah. they will raise 12 young. If you give them a 30 gram carcass, a big mouse, they will raise 18 That's young. That's amazing. There's a uh, and so it's not, they all start out with the same number of young. They all lay, well, 25 to 30 eggs and then yeah. within a day or two, before food is limiting, so it's not like, oh, we're starving yeah. to death, but when there's still plenty of food, that's when the young disappear. 
that sounds like uh, you know a more sophisticated life form that you know would be doing these things. You know, like maybe uh, you know apes or you know chimpanzees or something. It's, is this is this unusual for insect behavior that they would have such a complicated uh, child rearing method? Well, I mean, social insects, uh, the honeybees, the the example you could use, yeah. and that's one which is declining rapidly today. Uh, which, if we lose it, will have a huge impact on right. farming industries and, and, and uh, raising crops. Uh, they have an amazingly social system uh, where they have communication, where they tell each other where food is, which direction it is, how far it is. Uh, they have uh, the ability to recruit new individuals, let's go out and look for a new hive. Uh, so they have amazing communication. Uh, Bearing beetles aren't that sophisticated, but they certainly are sophisticated. Right. Um, so so you, 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 there is a bit of a social network here of some kind, right? Is that? Well, there's social Is it just between the, uh, the parents and the, because you, you mentioned sibling rivalry, uh, I think. Right, I, so the, yeah. if you think about it, if you, you're 100% related to yourself, yeah. but you share on average 50% uh, of the same <clears throat> genes with your sibling. Okay. So. The prediction is, is you should always, up to a certain point, act selfishly. Uh, and so, uh, in the case of uh, burying beetles, yeah. uh, the larvae will compete with each other to try to get the, the better feeding spot. And yeah. uh, another work that I did previously, we looked at species of bird called cattleigrits, uh, which are um, related to like a heron. And the baby birds literally peck each other to death uh, when food becomes limiting. Oh, really? And so, Depending on you know the circumstances and the weaponry involved, a uh, egret can peck each other each other to death. A, a bearing beetle can't, uh, but the parents do it for them by eating uh, their their um, siblings so that they themselves have more food. Yeah, are, are there um, less inter less interesting uh, insects that we're not trying to protect because they they don't attract our attention as much? Well, I mean there are lots of insects that are considered rare or, or endangered yeah. uh, on like beach areas. There's, uh, but I, I guess my, my point is that, you know, do, um, do we tend, you know, is this, is this beetle selected as something that we're being concerned about because it's so interesting or um, how, does it, how does it come up as a well, item to be protected? According to the Endangered Species Act, yeah. all organisms which are uh, in danger of going extinct yeah. uh, deserve protection. Okay. Uh, whether you are a, a little blind cricket that lives in a cave or you are a burying beetle that lives uh, you know, in the forest. Right. Uh, so from that perspective, legally, they all need to be protected. I see. Well, so in this project you're working on, how many species are, are being cared for here? Well, the, just one, the American oh, burying beetle, uh, okay. which is the uh, largest of the bearing beetle species. And okay. so it breeds actually on larger carcasses. So it might breed on something like a, um, a chipmunk size thing. Right. Uh, and they can literally move it, you know, several meters, yes. uh, and then find a good spot to then bury it under the ground. Okay, very interesting. We're going to take a quick commercial break. The Kelly Mart Roundtable will be right back. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. My guest today is Dr. Curtis Creighton. Uh, Curtis is a biologist, and we're continuing our discussion on the beetles and the zombies. 
<laughs> not the rock groups from the 60s, unfortunately. Um, Curtis, uh, tell me about the specifics of your research. So the grant that uh, we have received is to determine essentially what food items they use to reproduce on. Uh, okay. So we know that they need a certain size carcass, but we really don't know what's important for them in terms of the item that allows them to be successful. Right. And so we can use, uh, so all organisms, all life is made up of a number of molecules, including carbon and nitrogen. And we can look at the ratio of carbon and nitrogen to determine uh, where an organism is feeding, because what you feed on determines, or what you eat, determines what the ratio of these are in your body. And so you can analyze those ratios, which then allow you to determine where or what you've been feeding on that build your body. Now, a bearing beetle builds its entire body on the carcass that it's, that it's growing up on. And so we can look at the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, this is the, the idea, that then will allow us to determine what it's using as an important uh, resource uh, in the environment. So these, uh, these beetles get dissected occasionally, and you're, you're looking to see what, uh, what they're made out of, essentially, right? And well, we, what we do, actually, we don't even have to kill them to do the analysis. Oh, really? But what we can do is take a small little clip uh, out of their wing cover, for right. example, uh, and then we send it off, the little clip, off to a lab in uh, Arizona, which then does the analysis for us. And okay. so the grant that I received, or we received, is in part to paying for that analysis. We also have money for one undergraduate student here from Purdue Cal yeah. uh, to, uh, for a year to do research in the lab, uh, and then money to do the actual experiments and the travel that it involves and that sort of thing. So at some point, you're working on this here at Purdue University, Calumet, and then at some point you'll be out in the field actually setting this up. Is that part of it? That is part of it. So. Uh, we will go down to uh, some sites in Oklahoma uh, and collect beetles. Uh, we'll collect uh, the potential yeah. organisms that they use to breed on, like a, a, a chipmunk or a robin yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then we can use that to establish the baseline of what then uh, their yeah. uh, food items might be. And uh, what's the cost of this project? Uh, well, the grant is for $25,000. Uh, a component of that pays for the lights and the, and the uh, uh, electricity to run right. the stuff. Uh, and then uh, a significant portion is to pay an undergraduate student uh, here for uh, one year. Uh, and that he or she will then be involved in uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, care of the, uh, the beetle as well as conducting yeah. some of the experiments. So what does your, your lab look like? Is it, uh, you know, how many beetles are you working with? Things like that. Well, right now, we don't have the endangered one. We'll get those next summer. Oh, but okay. we do have uh, two other species that we work with. Uh, and I have currently uh, five graduate students who are working on their masters, yeah. uh, doing various aspects, of, looking at various aspects of their breeding biology. Yeah. I, you know, I have no familiarity with this, I, although I do uh, remember this scene in Silence of the Lambs where they get this moth uh, <laughs> and they take it in to uh, be analyzed and, um, and they take it to two guys in a university lab somewhere, I would guess, right? And they, Probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and they were treating the, the moth like it was, you know, like it was a child and they were, you know, very protective of it. Like, do you, do you know, develop, did people develop attachments with the beetles in the lab? Well, I, th I think they're very pretty. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm biased. Um, and they're actually, an insect is fairly robust as things go. They have an exoskeleton, uh, the, the crunch when you step on right, them. We right. don't step on our beetles, however. But, oh, that's but, good, yeah. Um, we, um, we don't name each one. Um, I don't anyway. I'd have yeah. to ask my students if they have a favorite. Right. You don't name them George or Paul or. Uh, no, anything. nor Ringo. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> um, well, uh, on a more serious note, how did you become interested in, in this? You were an undergraduate once. And I was an undergraduate once, yeah. and I was, uh, I think my first career option was to be a fur trapper in the Yukon. And that, that, was, that was, and I decided. Seriously? Yeah, that's what I wanted to be. Uh, I realized that that made me a little difficult to, yeah. to pull off, and yeah. I just wanted to, initially, I just wanted a job to be outside. I, my dad was a, a park ranger, 
uh, in the National Park Service, and I spent uh, my summers all outside virtually every day, all day. Oh, sounds uh, perfect. Yeah. And so um, that was, and I was also sort of a nerdy boyhood bird watcher, uh, yeah. and so I, I liked birds a lot. I still do. Yeah. Um, in fact, I teach a ornithology class in the summer, even though I do my research on, on beetles primarily. Yeah. Uh, and I always had a strong environmental ethic uh, and an interest in protecting uh, the things that we as humans are actively destroying. Yeah. And so you, your PhD is in zoology. What, what does that involve? What do you study? So it was in zoology. My actual thesis topic was, uh, I think the title of it, I can't remember exactly, but it was like evolution of clutch size in a varying beetle, the Crawford sorbiculus or something like Oh, you like started that. out with beetles. <laughs> you stuck with them all well, the yeah, years. Yeah, and my master's degree was with uh, cattle egrets, as I mentioned before. Uh, and then... Um, now, is that like egret the bird? Egret the bird, right. Okay. Right, so I found that these beetles were much easier to do lab experiments with than, let's say, a, you know, a crow-sized bird. So. Right, right, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, well, tell us about the specifics of the grant, because um, you know, we know that grants are made to do things like this, and, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm one of those people that thinks we should be protecting uh, endangered species, so I, you know, I really support this. Uh, but I really have no idea what it actually involves, so other than um, than watching them and testing them. What, when you get out into the field so prime, you're setting this up, what do you do there? So primarily what we'll do in the, in the field is collect the potential organisms that they could be feeding on. And then what we will do is uh, take samples that will be analyzed. It's a stable isotope analysis. So we'll analyze the stable isotopes of carbon to nitrogen, which all of us are uh, in a big part made of. Yeah. Uh, and then, as it turns out, if you feed on, if you are an herbivore, you feed on plants, your ratio of carbon and nitrogen is going to be different than if you are a carnivore, you feed on uh, other animals. And if you are something that eats a carnivore, your carbon ratio will change as well right. compared to if you eat something that eats, that if you are, uh, er eat herbivores, for example. And so we can use these predictable patterns to determine uh, what species they're using as a food source. This okay. will help in the management of uh, the species and hopefully right. its um, protection. So have you done other projects like this? Um, I spent a lot of time in graduate school uh, tromping around the woods of eastern Oklahoma uh, yeah. doing surveys. I was actually employed by the uh, Oklahoma Natural Heritage Inventory. Uh, and I did a, a large number of surveys uh, throughout the eastern part of uh, Oklahoma, as well as in western Arkansas, uh, for the presence or absence of this beetle. And um, any other projects that were involved uh, with protecting the environment because of a pipeline or something like that? Well, I was involved in some surveys. I also have been involved in a project in Utah where, um, so uh, many of our western rivers, and eastern rivers for that matter, have, have been very channelized. So they take out the natural meanders. Uh, that has a big negative impact on the environment as well as the community of organisms in it. So there's been a push to reestablish the natural flow of some of these rivers. Okay. And I was involved in a project to see, they reestablished the natural flow. And then uh, me and a, a several colleagues were hired to sample the natural fish communities to see if it actually was having the desired impact. In other yeah. words, were they creating a more natural um, fish community? And, and that was something that uh, I've uh, been involved with as well. Yeah, interesting. You know, um, is there any way the public can be made more aware of these things? I, I just know that I, you hear a lot of uh, complaints from people who want to push through uh, construction projects and things like that, and they, you know, they use the spotted owl as the example of you know, something standing in the way of progress. Where do we go to hear, you know, if you're watching television, uh, you know, where do you go to, to hear stories about the, you know, the value of preserving life and things like that, preserving well, diversity? I mean, certainly uh, my kids always watch the National Geographic Channel and the yeah. uh, Discovery Channel and, and various, those sort of things. Yeah. Um, I make my kids actually read books. That's good, <laughs> which, yeah. Uh, 
uh, is also important. Uh, and I think in my household anyway, we talk about stuff. We, yeah. we, we talk about these things. Uh, and endangered species, I always use the analogy that you know, maybe we lose one or two, maybe that's no big deal. And certainly there is a natural background extinction, right? right. Uh, but I always use the analogy of an airplane. And of course, an airplane is held together with rivets. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're flying through the air uh, at 30,000 feet, you know, you pop a few rivets, it's probably no big deal. But at some point, that plane is, you're not going to want to be on it anymore. Right. Uh, and you can think of these species that we're losing uh, as those individual rivets. And it may be one or two won't have a big impact, but someday they will. Uh, and do you want to be at, get to the point where we truly negatively impact our earth because of processes, uh, or we've ended processes as a result, they can't be reestablished. Right. Well, I think that's a good argument. And that, that, of course, that looks at how this impacts us. But there's also the argument, of course, that we should, uh, we should preserve these species because they're there. Right. Um, they are a product of millions of years of evolution. Yeah. And when one goes extinct, yeah. you, A, you can't recreate that process, and you can't right. recreate that organism. Even if you could biologically uh, reconstruct it genetically, uh, you know, they've talked about doing that with various, um, you know, the, the mastodon or, or the passenger pigeon. Right. And that, is, that's a very expensive endeavor, which seems a more logical if way. Would possible, just be key, right? If it's possible, yeah. if we can do Jurassic Park. We're right? now we're on Jurassic Park. <laughs> we're going to end with Jurassic Park. Uh, that's all the time we have for the program today. Thank you for joining me on Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. Have a great day.